There is no way you can defeat me, MBT. You are but an insect to my power. An insect? That gives me an idea. Let's see you defeat me now. Ah, uh, what? And I haven't even started yet. Okay, so... Try this on for size! Mm hmm Check this out! How, how many of these are you gonna do? As many as it takes! I, I don't have time for this. You know what? You, you wait. Hey everybody, Joseph Rothschild here, a.k.a. MBT, back again with another episode of 10 Minute Testing. It's been a long and clickbaiting road, but we've finally reached the end of our series of small buffs. I know I'll miss milking monarchs for ad revenue for the millionth time. Unfortunately, this last in a litany of decks long overdue for an unhit concludes with an archetype I've literally never played, presenting Insector. So here's the list, and... I have no idea how you're all going to take it, given how variable lists online are. As always, I'll give you a background about the archetype, a little bit of a discussion about what I hope the deck can do, and of course, the card by card. So firstly, for those of you that don't know, Insector is... I don't know. I'm about as lost as you are on this one. Uh, this deck was meta during a period in my life when I was trying to get laid. And as a result, I didn't play much Yu-Gi-Oh! outside of extremely hard-to-find locals and the occasional shame closet. The wiki claims that they're an archetype of dark insect monsters that equip to each other released in 2012, and I have no reason to disagree with the brain geniuses behind the 10,000 card deep female list. Recently, these creepy crawlies have wormed their way into Duel Links, where they're a powerful and consistent tier 8 option for budget duelists who started playing around the same time Roaming Weevil was active. They're most known for a combo involving Insector Dragonfly and Insector Hornet, who together represent between four and infinity individual card pops and several hundred special summons. While this combination of cards is largely unsearchable and demands additional enablers, by 2012 standards, the format was in dire need of pest control. Only now has their seminal semi-limit been removed, but now that these bad bugs are back in action, it's time to see if they're capable of colonizing the metagame. Only, no one seems to be in agreement as to what these builds should look like. I've been combing through locals' reports, as that's the only place people feel confident enough to break out the bugs, and I can't find anything consistent. Some gamers are on 30 Garnet Brickfests to build amazing turn 1 boards once in a billion games, while some duelists default to Dugares setups. In my experience, both of these builds are abysmal, so I took to testing in an attempt to construct a colony of my own. What I ended up with was this, a deck that blinds second, relies on the convenient star line of the Danger All-Stars and Cherubini, and abuses the advantageous typing of the fourth best Danger for Picophalina. Let's call her Pico. The result is a deck that deploys Dangers to bait interaction before Insector Dragonfly makes an appearance, aided by Hornet through Cherubini and a single Giga via Pico. From there, it's a 97-step non-linear combo to board building, dozens of destructions, and game-ending bunguses like Boral Sword. So with that, let's get into the card by card. Firstly, our single hand trap, Phantasme, and yes, I'm sorry, you have to play him. He protects your otherwise fragile insectors and smooths out hands in a deck that's inconsistent as all hell. After that are the dangers, two Nessie as an Omni Searcher, two Sneck and Jackalope for Cherubini, and three Mothman. Depending on which portion of the combo you lack, you'll prioritize these differently. Next are our Insectors. For the Equipees, we're on three Dragonfly, three Hornet, three Centipede, and one Searchable Ladybug doing double duty both as an Equipper and a Dragonfly Effect Enabler. Next are our Equip Burrs, two Gigamantis and two Giga Weevil. You don't really want to draw more than one, and we're perfectly happy equipping them via Pico, so I'm not maxing out on these guys. For spells, we're on three Allure of Darkness for consistency, three Pot of Desires for the same reason, three Called by the Grave, three Cocoon of Ultra Evolution to see Dragonfly just a little bit more, one Monster Reborn, and one Zect Caliber. It's an incredible extender, but it's also responsible for about 99% of your baddest bricks. In the extra, we're on a load of Link 4s, Boral Sword, Ceruya, and Appaloosa alongside Nightmare Griffin and Curious for adorable reasons. You can produce huge Link boards if you pop off, so we're on Trigate Wizard, fresh from Firewall's Funeral, alongside Nightmare's Unicorn, Phoenix, and Cerberus. We're on two Pico to equip Gigas and Hornets from our deck, and Cherubini to bin Hornets as well. Finally, Beat Cop, Lambda, and Clara are all insurance against Degeneracy. So with that, let's jump into the games. Our first match is up against Pendulum. 
I know, pretty powerful for game one, but I have my sights set just a little bit higher than a positive reactor win rate. Our opponent's also playing something slightly off meta. They're all the way in on Endymion, playing a suite of spellcasters to facilitate such spells as Magician's right hand. Let's see what they can set up turn one. They're going to lead with a copy of Servant of Endymion, of course, followed by a scaled chronograph who will fetch a time gazer from deck. Afterwards, they're going to scale a copy of Abdicator alongside an activated Magician's right hand, and then spend the three spell counters on a Jackal King. Next, they will link summon, who else? Heavy Metal Foes Electromite, which will fetch a Phantasme from our hand. After that, they're going to set scales and Pendulum Summon, oh yikes, another Jackal King alongside a Chronograph Sorcerer. They'll use Electromite to put this Chronograph back in their hand, triggering the effect of Chronograph and drawing off the top, not a scale, not a scale, ugh, a high scale even. They'll overlay for a copy of Norito, and this is two Spell Negates and two Monster Negates we're going to have to chew through. We'll activate the effect of Gigamantis, then activate Cocoon to proc the first Spell Negate. Afterwards, when we activate Danger Nessie, our opponent negates. Now they only have one Jackal King that can activate. Let's go to Battle Phase. We will crash into it alongside eating the Electromite and try to pop off in Main Phase 2. We'll start with the Mothman. We draw a copy of Monster Reborn. That's a good start. We'll activate another Mothman who doesn't do anything but give us fodder for the Cocoon of Ultra Evolution. We draw a Ladybug off the top and now we have full combo. We'll trigger the effect of Dragonfly to get a Centipede, then trigger the effect of Centipede in order to get a Hornet. It doesn't matter what we're getting. We're just discarding it for Pico. Pico is going to attach a Hornet who will destroy our copy of Gigamantis, which of course will trigger two instances of Dragonfly's effect. We'll special a centipede from Graveyard off of Gigamantis's effect, and two centipedes from Deck off of Dragonfly's. Each centipede represents at least a Hornet Pop, so we'll do that twice in order to clear the board before we equip a copy of Giga Weevil to extend further. We'll then special summon from our Graveyard a copy of Ladybug, because of course Ladybug is both an equipper and an equipee who can add a Hornet as well. We're going to use Ladybug's effect to destroy the remaining scale, and from this position we should be able to eat absolutely everything. We'll link summon a copy of Nightmare Unicorn to shuffle back this Norito before going into Phoenix and clearing the way for lethal. One advantage this archetype has over other rogue options is an ability to capitalize on stumbled turn ones for meta. This is exemplified in our second match against Sky Striker. Our opponent's going first, and their hand is only okay. They'll normal summon a copy of Ray, use multi rolls effect on Ray, who will tag out for a copy of Shizuku, enabling us to special summon a Phantasme from our hand, followed by a Sept called by the Grave and a Shizuku activation. We have a one turn window to win the game, and I think we can do it. We'll activate Dragonfly's effect, then Allure of Darkness. We'll activate Hornet on a set card. We're trying to bait these out at this point. It's an Eagle Booster, which is fine. We'll use Dragonfly to get a copy of Centipede for another Hornet. We'll activate Jackalope's effect. It is summoned. We'll activate Snacks as well, fetching a Called by the Grave, and now the shields are down. We'll go ahead and activate Pot of Desires, drawing a couple of cards, followed by an Allure of Darkness. No Giga yet! We'll activate the effect of Centipede off of the Hornet Pop, and then bring back the Hornet, who can attach itself, of course. We're going to go into Pico and equip a copy of Ladybug from deck. We'll activate Hornet on our copy of Gigamantis, bringing back a copy of Centipede. Centipede's effect will activate our opponent seeing the writing on the wall. We'll concede. So, it's time for game three, and you know what that means, a best of three versus meta. Our opponent's playing Thunder Dragon. I thought it would be fun to play against a deck that resists destruction, and boy oh boy does Thunder do that. Let's see if we can play through the debilitating effect of Colossus. Our opponent's going to lead with an Allure of Darkness, Spanishing Dark in order to add a Hawk to hand before normal summoning a copy of Solar, sending a copy of Roar, specialing a pack with Hawk, and generating a token. They'll link Summon to some Summer, go into Colossus number 1. They'll use Roar for a Matrix, turning into Colossus number 2 and a Matrix to hand, afterwards activating a couple of instances of Thunder Dragon, and summoning a Titan. Yikes. We'll lead with a copy of Allure of our own, slightly less impactful, followed by a Pot of Desires. Things aren't looking great. They're going to activate a Dark, though. That's one wasted pop. We'll normal summon a copy of Dragonfly. They'll activate Matrix, but thankfully we have just the Quick Play spell to prevent Titan's activation. We'll equip a copy of Gigamantis and fire some dangers. Uh, thankfully, these Nessies do hit. We'll activate Cocoon of Ultra Evolution only to shuffle a card back. We really need something here. Finally, we find Hornet, but oh man, the card destruction effect. Not particularly good against the monsters that resist destruction. Well, we can still spam the board, which might be good enough. We'll use Pico's second effect to draw a card. Okay, it's Fant. We'll use Unicorn to tuck one of these suckers back in, but unfortunately we are one monster off of making a dual-linked Trigate, which is our only out to this board. We'll Hornet the remaining monster for futility's sake and concede. So it's time for game two, and at the very least this hand looks slightly less good. Our opponent's going to lead with a copy of Allure of Darkness. They're going to draw a couple of cards, banishing this Roar. They'll Roar for a Thunder Dragon, then activate Fusion to go into Colossus, activate Allure of Darkness, and... Oh! That's the end of the turn. 
Well, well, well. We'll normal summon a copy of Dragonfly, equipping a Giga Weevil. They will activate Dynamiscus. We will cocoon in response. They'll ash in response. But we have called by the grave. Take that five deep chain. We'll tag out into another copy of Dragonfly, which isn't fantastic here, but is still probably good enough. We'll shuffle this card back into the deck with cocoon, and with no Thunder Monsters in Graveyard, we are free to just destroy this Thunder Dragon Colossus. We'll attack directly for 26, set a copy of called by the grave, and pass it back to our opponent. Our opponent draws a Hawk for turn. They'll activate Thunder Dragon Fusion for a Solar. They'll Solar Effect to send a copy of Roar than Hawk, which we will, called by the grave. Now, unfortunately, it only negates the effect, which means they can still make Colossus and eat our Dragonfly, but as long as we have any Insector on our side of the field, we should be able to win this turn. We'll activate the effect of Pot of Desires, drawing a couple of cards off the top. Sweet Rip, by the way, before activating Centipede's effect in order to re-equip Hornet and Hornets to destroy Giga Weevil. From here, we should be able to pop off with Giga Mantis. We'll activate Giga Mantis's effect alongside two instances of Dragonfly. That's going to special a Centipede and, what do you know, a third one to our side of the field, enabling us to make Nightmare Unicorn tuck this back safely. They're going to go into Phantasmay, but from this position we should be able to win. We'll use Snex Effect and then re-equip Hornet to destroy Phantasmay, fetching the remaining card out of our opponent's hand, enabling us to afterwards go into a copy of Cerberus. We'll draw a card off of it, then perform our normal summon to do 22, 16, and exact lethal. So it's time for that old important game 3 and... Oh man, this is looking good. Thunder Dragon and Thunder Dragon Hawk, that's a brick if I've ever seen one. Let's see if we can get it done. They're going to lead with a copy of Thunder Dragon, and then a second copy of Thunder Dragon, followed by a Thunder Dragon Hawk, and a single Colossus. This is all we have to out. Unfortunately, we don't have Dragonfly access. We're going to lead with a copy of Mothman, which finds a second Jackalope. We'll Jackalope into Jackalope, special summoning a Mothman from deck before we link summon a Pico. Now, unfortunately, while Hornet can have monsters equipped to it, it doesn't get any benefit from those monsters going to the graveyard. So while it's an effective engine to pop your opponent's cards, it doesn't summon a whole bunch of times and put pressure on the opponent. As a result, we're able to clear the board by Link summoning a copy of Nightmare Unicorn, but only able to do about 4,500 points of damage. Our opponent then is free to summon Kanemari Attack and go into Titan, triggering Dark's Effect for Thunder Dragon Fusion, which makes a second Titan, putting a Fusion in Graveyard, and allowing them to activate Thunder Dragon two times in the hand, wiping our entire board. They'll get in for 3,200 points of damage, but things are looking dire. They're going to pass it back to us, and for turn, what do we draw but the single card that can win us the game, Giga Weevil. All right, well, the deck is bricky. I suppose I can't be too mad about bricking. So we're back with the deck, and boy, this went a lot better than expected. Let's do the pros and cons. First, the pros. One, it's explosive as all hell. Now, a lot of these combos that seemed broken nearly a decade ago are completely benign now, but I'm here to report that a near-infinite amount of conditionless card pops that summons eight monsters is just as good today as it was in 2012. I can see why they were nervous to unban this, which is something I can't say about any of the other itty-bitty buffs. Two, the dangers are amazing. They're both exceptional enablers for Cherubini setups and brilliant baits for the 18 negates your pendulum opponent will end on turn one. And three, there is nothing more embarrassing than holding Nibiru until your opponent is done playing their 8-year-old archetype's 12-minute turn, only to realize they've made an Opelousa with pack filler tier insects. And the cons. One, it is wildly inconsistent. Yes, we are on just about as much draw power as we possibly can be, but without a Dragonfly turn one, our ability to close games is incredibly constrained. Two, because it's so Dragonfly-reliant, the deck has a clear and debilitating choke point. While it can play through negates during the setup phase, one well-timed piece of removal will squash your turn. And three, there are decks that resist it. It turns out, even if you generate 15 pieces of removal per main phase, one Thunder Dragon is going to be a hassle no matter what. All in all, it is a wildly inconsistent deck with a sky-high ceiling. While the strength of its power plays was certainly improved by the recent unban, the catastrophic choke point wasn't. Don't expect much from these insects. So that's that. While I appreciate all of my viewers, a special thanks to my patrons, especially Tyler Slacks, Crispy, Sir Tachyon, Mika Reichman, Distrin, Lucas Geerdes, Adam Trevino, 2nd, Lieutenant Labcoat, Fighting Fangwong, Meepmoto27, Burrito Man 93 Adrian Bra, Adam Sundquist, Isaac Jackson, and Donnie Fillerup. If you like what you see, please consider subscribing. And if you want to be part of the process, follow me on Twitch as well. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.